Well, good morning. It is so great to worship with you all in the Great Hall this morning. I always enjoy it. If we haven't met yet, my name is Megan Hendrickson. I am the Minister to Women and Discipleship Resource Director here at Park Cities. I'd love to meet you right after this service, right outside those doors in the Next Steps area if you haven't introduced yourself yet. Well, as you just saw in the video, we've been in a summer sermon series digging into the book of 1 Timothy entitled Paradox as we consider this upside-down kingdom way of living. That is the way of Jesus Christ. That is, by definition, countercultural, set apart, and distinct. And so this morning, our paradox is courage in the age of anxiety. And I do want to note that I'm not talking about clinical anxiety today, but the general human experience of feeling anxious. And it really is my delight to get to dive into God's word and his presence with you this morning. So as we've been doing all summer, if you could please stand with me to honor the Lord our God who inspired his word for us today. As we read together in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 11 through 16, Paul writes, But as for you, O man of God, flee these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things, And of Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will display at the proper time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see, to him be honor. And eternal dominion. Amen. Will you pray with me? Lord our God, you alone are the only sovereign, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. There's never been anyone like you. There never has been. There never will be. And yet you see us, God. You saw fit to create us. To love you in response to your love for us. You choose to reveal yourself to us by your spirit and in your word. So Holy Spirit, will you illuminate your word of truth for us today? Holy Spirit, will you speak? I have nothing to offer anyone here about 1 Timothy chapter 6, but I believe your Holy Spirit in me does. So Holy Spirit, we want to hear from you. God, this time is yours, and so are we. Have your way among us for your glory and our good. Amen. You may be seated. So as I said, this summer we're um, digging into paradox, and you'll see as we jump right here into verse 11 in 1 Timothy chapter 6, it starts perfectly for our sermon series because Paul is writing to Timothy as he's serving among the church at Ephesus, and he says to Timothy, but as for you, O man of God, But as for you, O man of God, you see, Paul earlier in this chapter has been calling out false teachers in the church at Ephesus, but now he's speaking directly to Timothy, and he's calling him to live a set-apart, distinct, different, upside-down kingdom way of living, right? And likewise, as you've noticed all summer, we've seen that Paul is not only encouraging Timothy, but God has given us this word today to encourage us personally, So if it's helpful for you as you read today, I want to give you permission as you read this to hear the word of the Lord. But as for you, O man of God, but as for you, O woman of God, but as for you, O child of God, flee these things. Flee these things. Well, that's another interesting way for us to jump into the text because you can't help but wonder halfway through the chapter, what are these things that we're supposed to be fleeing? Timothy and us today. Well, it could be a number of things. All summer we've been in 1 Timothy and we've seen how Paul's been calling out the shortcomings of leadership in the church at Ephesus. So it surely could be one of those things. But I think most recently you can look at verses 4 and 5 of this same chapter 6 as Paul's calling out false teachers and he describes them as having an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels about words 
Make note of that word quarrels. We'll come back to it soon. Which produce envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions, and constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth. Paul says, flee these things. And then he says, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. So Paul says, flee and pursue. This is strong language because to flee is to run fervently away from. And to pursue is to run fervently toward. So Paul is not saying instead of fleeing, pursue. Paul's saying flee and pursue. In the kingdom of God, we are to flee and pursue. And pursue what? Well, he tells us. Do you hear it? Righteousness shines in the face of injustice. Godliness shines in the face of evil. Faith shines in the face of disbelief. Love shines in the face of hate. Steadfastness shines in the face of inconsistency. And gentleness shines in the face of cruelty. Paul says, flee those things, but pursue these good things. These good things our soul so desires. And I have to ask, who most radiates every single one of these qualities to the fullest extent? Is it not Christ Jesus our Lord? The one our soul truly desires. The only one we were created to worship. Flee those things. Pursue these good things. Pursue Christ Jesus, our King. In the kingdom of God, we're to flee and pursue. But to flee is not to pursue. Just as to flee is not to fight. I think about it this way. Several years ago, I had a friend who was dating a guy, and they seemed like a pretty good match on a lot of counts, except for... They weren't quite on the same page when it comes to faith in Jesus. You see, this guy had grown up in a cult that was marked by morality. And although he had since left the cult before they started dating, I remember talking to my friend and saying, you know, just because he left that cult doesn't mean that he ran straight into the arms of Jesus. Just because he fled that cult doesn't mean that he is actively pursuing a relationship with Jesus. You see, I think of that when I think of fleeing is not pursuing. To flee is not to pursue. To flee is not to fight. So if you'll jump forward in verse 12, that's our memory verse for this week. And I invite you to join us as we allow God to write his word on our heart. Verse 12, Paul says, fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Fight the good fight of the faith. Remember I told you to mark in verse 4 that word quarrels. Those false teachers who have an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels about words. Well, that's fighting language, isn't it? Quarrels. But now Paul's telling us to fight. So some fights are not worth fighting. Some fights we've got to flee from like these fights. But some fights are good fights. And the fight of the faith Faith in Christ Jesus, that is a fight fight worth fighting. Fight the good fight of the faith. When it comes to life in Christ, it's not fight or flight. It's flight and fight. I know that's hard to catch. I'll say it again. When it comes to life in Christ, it's not fight or flight. It's flight and fight. We are to flee and to fight. I recently was talking through this passage with a new friend of mine over coffee named Candace, and she said something that I found to be really honest and true. She said, saying yes to what God has for me is often harder than saying no to what God does not have for me. How does that land with you today? Saying yes to what God has for me is often harder than saying no to what God does not have for me. In other words, fighting is often harder than fleeing. Why is that? Why is it harder for us to say yes to what God has for us than it is for us to say no to what he doesn't have for us? Why is it harder to fight than it is to flee? You see, I'm convinced that the Holy, Sp- the Holy Spirit lives in us and has called and created us and freed us to live an eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. But I'm also convinced that we have a very real enemy who's convinced us that we're living a full life in Christ Jesus. 
as we seem to be, be fleeing from things that we consider to be evil. Meanwhile, we're not fighting the good fight of the faith. We're not taking hold of the eternal life to which we were called. We were created to flee and to fight. Where are you today? What do you need to say no to so that you can say yes to what God has for you? You and I don't know what's on the other side of that yes, but I promise you that God does flee and fight the good fight of the faith. We've got to flee before we can fight. We've got to say no so that we can say yes. And you know, Jesus did this. Jesus didn't entertain evil. But he also didn't sit back and enjoy the comforts of life, did he? Jesus fought the good fight of the faith, even unto death. And you better believe he proved victorious over death and sin and evil. As he rose from the grave, as he made a way for us to take hold of eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. He made a way for us to have courage in the age of anxiety. Because you see, courage is not, not experiencing anxiety. Courage means anxiety doesn't have the last word. Courage means Christ Jesus our Lord has the last word, the one who conquered sin and death, the one who conquers every single one of our anxieties and fears, Jesus Christ. So when we pursue Jesus, we are fighting the good fight of the faith. When we pursue Jesus, we are finding courage in an age of anxiety. When we pursue Jesus, we are taking hold of the eternal life to which we were called and about which we made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. And so you may wonder, what is this eternal life we're to take hold of? Well, we often think of eternal life as heaven or life after, after death, and, and that's fair. But the truth of the matter is that eternal life starts at the moment of our salvation by grace through faith in Christ Jesus our Lord. So if eternal life starts at the moment of our salvation, then we're still left asking, what in the world is eternal life? Well, I believe eternal life is not only about length, but about depth, richness, value, and fullness in relationship with Christ Jesus our Lord. So if we're going to look at what eternal life is, this life we're to take hold of, then maybe we should look no further than what Jesus had to say about it himself. In John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So Jesus said he is the life. Well, you may say, well, he doesn't say he's the eternal life, and that's fair too. So let's jump forward a few chapters. In John chapter 17, verse 3, Jesus is praying, and would you know he's praying for us? And Jesus says this, and this is eternal life. Okay, let's look. That they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Jesus prays for us that we would know God, the only true God, and Christ Jesus himself, the one sent by God. This is eternal life. Eternal life is life in Christ. It's life with Christ, and it's life because of Christ. Eternal life is life in Christ. It's life with Christ, and it's life because of Christ. You were created to fight the good fight of the faith. You were created to take hold of the eternal life to which you were called. But hear me, that as I'm sounding the call that's right here in the scripture to flee and to fight, to pursue, it's in response to the fact that God has been pursuing us, that God fights for us. You know, in Psalm 23, it begins by saying, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And if you jump forward to verse 6, which is the last verse of that chapter, it says, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. If you read the New Living Translation, it says, surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life. Friends, God has been pursuing us always. So as we pursue him, we're responding to his pursuit of us. As we fight for him, it's because he fights for us. This is active language. You see it in this passage as Paul says, pursue, fight, flee, take hold of. We are created to be in an active relationship with Jesus, not merely a passive association with Jesus, to flee and to fight, to take hold 
of the eternal life to which we were called. Friends, I got to ask, are you fighting for him? Are you fighting for him in your own life? Are you fighting for him in your own mind? Are you fighting for him in your home and your family? Are you fighting for him with your friends and your coworkers? Are you fighting for him at school, at work, here in the church, in this city, in this nation, in this world? Are you fighting for him? It starts with us. It starts within us as we flee and we fight. We are created to flee and to fight and take hold of the eternal life to which we were called and about which we made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. But have you made that good confession? Have you confessed and believed that Jesus is Lord and God raised him from the dead? If not, maybe today is the day of your salvation. Maybe today is the day that you need to make that good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Maybe today is the day that you begin eternal life with Christ, in Christ, and because of Christ. And if you have made that good confession... And I want to ask you to remember the day of your salvation. Where were you? What was happening? What changed for you? That you confessed and believed that Jesus is Lord. How did you see Jesus? And where are you now? What's happening now? Where's Jesus? What role is he playing in your call to flee and to fight? How do you see him now? If you'll turn with me just a few pages to the right, we'll be in Hebrews chapter 12. We'll be in the first three verses of Hebrews chapter 12, and as we read it together, I want to ask that you look for similarities between this brief passage in Hebrews to what we've been looking into in 1 Timothy chapter 6. So Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, the author writes, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance, the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. Did you catch that similar language there? You know, the English Standard Version translates this very gently when it says, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin which clings so closely. Several other translations will use language like throw off, strip off, put off, get rid of, fling aside. The point is, sin is no joke. Get it off of you. Flee. Do you hear that? Not just set aside. Throw it off. Flee, but every translation says, and run, and run, with endurance, with patient endurance, with patience, run, lay aside and run, throw off and run. You see that language is the same language of 1 Timothy chapter 6, to lay aside and to run is to flee and to fight. But how do we run and how do we fight? Well, Hebrews tells us at the start of verse 2, it says, Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. How do we run? How do we fight? We look to Jesus. We consider him. When we consider him who endured, we are able to endure. When we consider him who ran his race, we are able to run our race. When we consider him who had joy, we find joy. 
Don't you know that the joy that was set before him, we just sang it, was not only being with the Father and sitting at the right hand of the throne of God. John tells us in chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. The Word was God. Jesus is the Word. Jesus has always been with God. So the joy that was set before Jesus as he endured the cross for us was not only to be with the Father, but it was to be with us. It was to be with us. It was to have eternal life with us as we live with him. Friends, flee and fight. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. You see, we find courage in an age of anxiety when we consider him who endured the cross and scorned its shame for the joy that was set before him. We were created to flee and to fight. Because to flee and to fight is to take hold of the eternal life to which we were called and about which we made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. To flee and to fight is to truly live eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So as we prepare to take the Lord's Supper together in just a moment, I want to ask that you reflect on Jesus, that you respond to Jesus. What do you need to say no to so that you can say yes to what God has for you? What do you need to flee so that you can fight? Because to flee and to fight is to take hold of eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. To flee and to fight is to truly live eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord.